Welcome. Uh, uh, thank you already for giving our, our distinguished guest, guests uh, uh, such, a, such a warm welcome yourselves, and, and we appreciate that. I'm Roly Keating. I'm Chief Executive here at the British Library, uh, and it is a pleasure to see you all at this very, very special event here. Propaganda is going to be the big theme of the year here at the British Library. Come May the 17th, we'll be opening um, one of our most substantial exhibitions, Propaganda, Power and Persuasion, which we think is the first time a major <coughs> national institution has tackled this idea in the round, drawing extensively on our own collections. Uh, we're going to be exploring state propaganda in all its forms, in war and peace, across the centuries, from ancient origins, particular focus on the 20th century, and also looking at where we are now and flashing ahead into the future. And this will be surrounded, we hope, by one of the biggest public programs of events and discussions and debates we've ever had. And nothing could be more appropriate or wonderful than that we kick off this great summer of reflection and debate than to have our, our guest tonight, probably the best person we could possibly have to stimulate discussion and debate. It's great to have him in London. Last night he was up the road, I think, at the Friends House delivering the Edward W. Said London lecture, tackling, in that case, the Middle East. Tonight, Noam Chomsky, uh, as I think needing very little introduction, uh, he's been at MIT for over 50 years, is, of course, um, perhaps the most influential figure in modern linguistics, one of the greats of analytic philosophy. Um, also, though, of course, the very model of the engaged public intellectuals, someone who brings their wisdom, spirit, intellectual curiosity and passion to bear on the great issues of our time, most famously, most trenchantly perhaps, for his cr consistent critique of American foreign policy, state capitalism and news media. And I think that may be part of our focus for discussion tonight. Um, Noam has written over 100 books, but one that resonates to this day, and I think will for a very, very long time indeed, is Manufacturing Consent from 1988, which established, yes, the propaganda model or analysis uh, of news media. Where, 25 years on, are we with that thesis? I think that'll be one of the questions we explore tonight uh, as collectively we swim in a sea of social media, the internet transforming the provision and shaping of news in front of our eyes. Here at the library, we try to collect the news. We collect newspapers, we collect online materials, we try and create a record of how news documents and shapes our world. And I can think of no one better to challenge us professionally and intellectually as to how we do that um, than uh, Noam, and I'm looking forward greatly to hearing what he has to say. It remains only for me to say thank you to the Eccles Center for American Studies based here at the library. It was founded uh, by David and Mary Eccles by, with a bequest in 1991, and it is one of the ways in which the, 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 the wonders and depth of our American collections are celebrated <laughs> year in, year out here. Uh, and events like this are typical of the kinds of events that the team put on, and we're very grateful for that. Also delighted to welcome uh, Jonathan Friedland. Uh, uh, he and I worked together in the founding days of BBC4, and it's very nice to be reunited uh, here tonight. Uh, of course, you'll have seen Jonathan's work uh, in Britain in The Guardian. Uh, you may see him in The New York Times, New York Review of Books, uh, and familiar as a voice uh, to millions on Radio 4's The Long View, connecting past, present, and future. And I'm sure that's what we're going to hear tonight. So please, our distinguished speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roly, for that uh, warm introduction. Uh, and Roly, really covering the ground of uh, uh, setting up what the conversation we uh, have tonight. And as, uh, as he said so aptly, our speaker, our guest of honour, couldn't be better placed uh, to discuss this subject. Uh, what we thought we would do is plunge right in with the flavour of the exhibition that's coming, uh, Propaganda, Power and Persuasion. And uh, Noam Chomsky has given me permission to do two things. Firstly, to do uh, what doesn't ha often happen in intellectually hallowed uh, environments like this, which is to do a quick fire round, which we will do on the screen in a moment. But also, uh, he tells me very graciously that he, his own children, and I'm guessing perhaps grandchildren as well, sometimes say, when they've asked a question, please give me the five-minute lecture <laughs> version. <laughs> so I, I, I pass that on because it means that if you see me appearing to be rudely 
winding up or moving on our uh, honoured guest, that is, I have the blessing and permission to do it, um, just as we move on, because we've got a lot of ground to cover. So, uh, on with the quick fire round. I, I thought it would be useful, uh, before we ask you to give us a very distilled version of, of, of what Rowley referred to, the propaganda model, that is the core thesis of manufacturing consent, if we just had a look at some examples of propaganda from uh, the exhibition, and in a way, just to do, uh, have a quick look at what is and what isn't. And um, I'm going to have a go with this. There we are. I hope everyone can see that. Um, ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer, one people, one state, I suppose, one Führer from, uh, we guess, I think, the 1930s. This a Soviet-era depiction of a weeping Statue of Liberty. I'm not sure how clear it is to all of you, but we have sort of secret police in the eyes of Lady Liberty, one a truncheon serving as a tear. And then this from the wartime period in the United States, the artist George, or rather Norman Rockwell, a very different meaning, George Rockwell, uh, Norman Rockwell, Save Freedom of Speech by War Bonds. Now, uh, Noam Chomsky, just start with these three. To, to, to the lay eye, these all look like examples of propaganda. What, what would you say? Well, the first one uh, evokes uh, childhood memories, which aren't pleasant. Uh, uh, there were, uh, it, was, it was a very scary period, the 1930s, especially if you're Jewish. And for me, it was, uh, I remember my parents would uh, sometimes play Hitler's speeches on the radio. I couldn't understand the words, but you could get the tone, and it was very frightening, especially the reaction. And it had a lot of personal meaning for me because we were the only Jewish family in a mostly Irish and German Catholic neighborhood. And uh, boys on the street uh, sensed that. It was very anti-Semitic. You know, the kids were all going to a Jesuit school, and when they came out, they were raving anti-Semites. Uh, so this was, uh, then they'd calm down later in the afternoon, you could play ball and that sort of thing. <laughs> but uh, I grew up with a visceral fear of Catholics. And uh, it's, uh, I'm the Irish were pro-Nazi because they were Irish, they hated the British and the Germans because they were German. This is off our topic, but now that we have a Jesuit Pope, does, does that yeah. little, well, did you I give it a little tremble the, when you heard about that? Well, it changed enough so that uh, when liberation theology came along, I got very close to the Jesuits. When I would visit, say, Nicaragua, I often lived in the Jesuit house, but it took a while to get over it because you know, these childhood fears are, can be pretty deep. Um, I, I got, when I got older, I realized that this is ridiculous, but uh, it's deep. And the Hitler imagery was very striking. I remember beer parties when Paris fell. Uh, it's, that was the environment. Interestingly, I never told my parents. In those days, uh, children, at least boys, didn't talk to their parents about personal things. So they never knew. I don't even think they knew what kind of neighborhood we lived in. You mean they didn't know your fear of some of the Nothing. people in the neighborhood? They didn't have any sense of what the neighborhood was like. They lived in a, well, you know what it was like. They lived, they were Hebrew teachers. They lived in a kind of uh, Hebrew ghetto, not physically, but mm. Uh, the only people they knew were similar people. I mean, I remember uh, women, my mother's friends, who would, all bilingual, of course, but they would call the, if they had to order something from a downtown department store, they'd insist on speaking Hebrew, so they'd get a Hebrew translator. You know, it was quite, and there was a big Kulturkampf going on at the time between the Hebrew and the Yiddish uh, uh, diaspora, and they were on the Hebrew side, so the, uh, their language was Yiddish, but I never heard a word of Yiddish when I was growing up. So very potent the, memories for you personally that we stir. Does it, yeah, do, it's rather difficult to hear. I wonder if you, you could very speak up a bit. Um, well, or maybe our colleagues there can turn up the volume on the microphone so, that, so you'll hear us amplified, so we'll, we'll take note of that. Um, to move, move to this painting, this poster um, from uh, the wartime period, it, it, does this count as propaganda as much as that first yeah, picture of Hitler? It's, uh, our version of socialist realism. You know, the, it's basically the same. And if this was the Second World War, of course. It's uh, them trying to 
stir up uh, patriotism for the Second World War. Actually, it's kind of striking to think about <coughs> what went on the, in the First World War. The Second World War, uh, the United States didn't get into it until it was attacked. Uh, some wanted to get in, but they didn't. First World War was quite different. Uh, the British had a, the first state propaganda system that I know of. It was called the Ministry of Information, the natural name for a propaganda system. <laughs> and uh, the purpose of the, the main purpose of the Ministry of Information was to convince Americans, American intellectuals in particular, and this is relevant to the propaganda model, convince American intellectuals that it was a noble war. Uh, during the First World War, uh, uh, intellectuals in every participant country were uh, lauding the magnificence of their own state. The few people who did agreed <coughs> mostly ended up in jail, like Richard Russell. But uh, they had to convince, they were trying desperately, of course, to get the Americans into the war. And uh, Woodrow Wilson had been elected in 1916 on a peace platform. The slogan was... Uh, peace, not victory. And they had to somehow turn the population around very quickly so they'd begin to hate everything German. And it was really, and it was very successful. And it, uh, it particularly, uh, uh, the progressive American intellectuals, you know, the John Dewey circle, New Republic intellectuals, uh, they turned completely. And they convinced themselves that, as they put it, this is the first time in history that uh, a country has gone into war not because of uh, military leaders and ch chauvinistic uh, leaders, but because of the, the intelligent members of the community reflected and decided that this is what had to be done, and then we turned the population around so that they joined us. Of course, the intellectuals who were, uh, they were being fed ludicrous British propaganda, the kind that was later exposed in the Bryce Report, and, you know, the Belgian children with their arms torn off and all that stuff. And it worked very well. And that's a kind of set off the modern system of propaganda. Well, I, w I want to get on to the, you, particularly your point about the propaganda model, but just before we leave our quick fire round, I want yeah. to have a look at two newer examples. Now, it... That's from the Occupy movement, as you said. The 99% have no borders. That's the clue. It's quite a deliberately retro style. But here's a cause. I, I particularly singled this out because I thought, here's a cause that broadly you might be sympathetic to. And yet, would you apply the label of propaganda to this image? Yeah, I'm sympathetic to the cause, but I don't like this technique of trying to bring people in. In fact, I, I can't stand listening to what's called the no, you know, uplifting rhetoric. It just really turns me off. And for the same reason, this kind of thing. It's an appeal to uh, emotions, not uh, understanding. And uh, it's obvious what it's trying to say, but... Uh, so you don't like it even when it's in the service of a cause, oh, you no, might simply... I can't stand it. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I can't listen to Martin Luther King's speeches, literally, although I greatly admire him. Because, because it's an... Just the style, you know. It's, a, it's an appeal. It's trying to arouse emotional support for something very significant. I mean, I don't criticize it. It obviously meant something. Well, if you didn't like Martin Luther King, what about this man? <coughs> oh, well, that's uh, uh, extreme. You, you can see the effect it had by the, on the funeral. Yes. Uh, it was just uh, worship. In fact, about the only thing like it outside of Kim Il-sung, maybe, was Ronald Reagan's uh, uh, death. Oh. It was treated like uh, uh, a king had died. In fact, you can read publications of the Hoover Institution, you know, at Stanford University, serious research outfit, uh, describing Reagan as a, how do they put it, a, a colossal figure whose uh, spirit hovers over us like a warm and friendly ghost. Uh, that's actually uh, George Washington was treated the same way. Mm. Uh, when the uh, colonies, the colonies had to create some sort of sense of national identity. I mean, the term United States was plural until the Civil War. There's a lot of states, you know, and uh, 
So they tried to create a national identity. You needed a heroic figure. So the, uh, the, uh, in the early 19th century, there was a George Washington cult that was stirred. It's where you get these uh, cherry tree stories and all yes. that business. It was all concocted to try to show that he was uh, uh, practically not human. He was a noble gentleman. Uh, uh, some of it's very funny. Uh, for example, if you go to the Capitol building today, uh, there's a statue of uh, George, around 1830, I think, of Washington uh, in the style of a Greek god. You know, he's Zeus. And, and there was criticism of it. But the criticism was because he was wearing a toga and his shoulder was showing. <laughs> but other than that, that's fine. He was God, you know, <laughs> perfect, perfect Roman, perfect. And know. this would fit that category of myth making. It's the same kind of thing. And it leaves you cold, um, regardless of the cause. This, that was by way of preamble, really, to, and, and it's, it's been very instructive already, this notion of myth-making, but what, a lot of people in this room will have read Manufacturing Consent. I'm guessing quite a few will have read it several times and committed it to memory. Um, but for those who haven't, and I'm quoting now your children, if you can give us the distilled version, the five-minute lecture on what the propaganda model is, and it, you wrote the book originally in 1988, and then I want to sort of push you on how that stands now. Well, actually, I should say that um, the, most of the work on the propaganda model itself was uh, due to my colleague, Edward Herman. He's a, a professor of finance. In fact, he's a, professionally, he was a specialist in corporate power and corporate control, wrote the standard work on it. And it's, uh, I mean, I agreed with it, but it's, I can't take credit for it. It was mostly his initiative. And I didn't totally agree for reasons I'll tell you. But... Uh, uh, what it is is a discussion of the institutional structure of the media. It's looking at the U.S. media, so not state media, but corporate media, and uh, asks an obvious question. If you look at the institutional structure and you ask what content you would expect to flow from it, what would you predict? And briefly, without going into the details, the uh, the media are huge corporations, uh, parts of larger conglomerates, uh, they sell, a, like other businesses, they sell a product to a market. Uh, the market is other businesses, advertisers. Uh, the product is uh, people. So they sell people to advertisers. Uh, so television, for example, makes no, no profit if you turn on the tube, but uh, they get it from the advertisers. And the newspapers mostly lose money when you subscribe. They do better from the advertisers. So, uh, so, it, so the first part of it is it's a major corporations selling people to other corporations. Uh, uh, and then there are other factors, like um, it's very easy to show that the corporate system is very tightly linked to, to government. Uh, people flow in and out. The, uh, um, and then the government itself produces just plain state propaganda, uh, and that enters and other factors like that. And then we ask, well, what would you expect to happen? What you'd expect to see overwhelmingly is a, a, f a choice of issues and framing of issues which reflects the interests and concerns of the state corporate nexus. That's what you'd predict. And then the rest of the book is running through examples. It's been a little misunderstood. It's a lot of journalists regard it as a criticism of journalists. It's exactly the opposite. Uh, in fact, about a third of the book, uh, the latter third, I suspect nobody ever read it, is a defense of journalists against attacks from liberals, from Freedom House. You know, the mm. Freedom House wrote a vicious attack, a couple volumes of attacks on uh, American journalists uh, for stabbing the United States in the back in Vietnam and losing the Vietnam War and so on. And they, uh, it's too... Um, uh, two volumes, one commentary, and, and the other, uh, the documentary background for it. And I'm kind of a masochist, so I actually read the documents. I'm probably the only person who ever read them. When you read the documents, you find that the commentary is totally falsified. And in fact, what it shows is that the journalists did an honest, courageous job. What they saw, they described accurately, and the criticisms are mostly fabricated. But they did it within the framework of a, uh, uh, an interpretation 
which is super chauvinistic. So, for example, if the United States uh, carried out some atrocity, it was a mistake, or uh, uh, the other side somehow caused it to do it, or, and then they leave things out. That, uh, but the actual reporting was uh, first rate, and I think you can trust it. Uh, and it's typically the case. So it's a defense of journalism, which the journalists didn't like. But how are the journalists able to do that kind of reporting that you do trust if they are simultaneously framing it in a way that you uh, they, don't they, trust? I mean, journalism is uh, you know, honest professionals. They have integrity. They, uh, especially working in the field takes a lot of courage, and, uh, and uh, they do an excellent job. But within a narrow structure, like there are certain topics that just won't, won't report. Uh, not out of the, it might be editorial pressure. And when they do report it, the uh, framework is essentially a patriotic framework. Um, you can see it all the time. I mean, uh, we give lots of examples. And in the book you dis distinguish, or you say that the media distinguishes between worthy victims and unworthy victims. Yeah. And worthy victims tend to be the victims of the United States enemies, well, or, and unworthy victims are those who are the well, victims of the United, United States, States are its clients. Yeah. So when um, say the Russians invade Afghanistan. The Afghans are worthy victims because the enemy is attacking them. And in fact, uh, reporting from Afghanistan during the uh, Russian invasion was from the side of the Mujahideen. That's where reporters went to work with the guerrillas. And uh, when the US invaded Afghanistan, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, uh, reporters didn't go work with the Taliban, you know. Uh, they reported from the point of view of the American army. In, fact, so in which case, I'm, I'm interested in how sincere your expression of admiration for journalists is. Pardon? I, I want to push you on how sincere the, your admiration that you expressed before for journalists, how sincere can that be it's if you're saying sincere. that they locate themselves on this side or that side, depending on what's going on, they mm. accept the frame and the narrative? Yeah. That sounds like a criticism to me. Well, actually, that, that's the one point in which Ed and I somewhat disagreed about the whole thing. I think uh, to, to, to have the book refer to the media is too narrow because I think it applies to the whole intellectual class. Uh, that's the way intellectuals are, uh, overwhelmingly, all through history. Uh, intellectuals overwhelmingly are servants of power. Now, intellectuals write history, so when you read what they write, they look very noble and adversarial and so on, but when you look at what actually happened, uh, they're, uh, all the criticisms we make of the media apply to them, and that's significant because none of the institutional factors hold in that case. Um, the institutional factors that we looked at have to do with the corporate structure, you know, the, the advertisers who purchase it, but that's And that not doesn't true. apply to the academy? That doesn't apply to college professors. I mean, there are other pressures, but not those. But the outcome is pretty much the same. I mean, this is, again, slightly off the topic, but if that is the case, what made you so different? In other words, if, if even always, intellectuals are subsumed look, into this. There's always a fringe of dissidents. Any society you look at, there's a fringe of dissidents. They're treated badly, usually. I mean, this goes back to the earliest recorded history. So go back to classical Greece. Uh, who drank the hemlock? It was the guy who was corrupting the youth by uh, uh, worshipping false gods, you know. And uh, it wasn't the guys who followed orders. Or take a look at, at the same time, uh, the other ancient records we have are the biblical records. In the biblical records, there's, there are people who we would call intellectuals. They weren't, in the English translations, it's called prophets. That's a bad translation of a very obscure Hebrew word which nobody understands. And they, they, they weren't prophets, they didn't prophesy. Uh, they were dissident intellectuals. You know, they condemned the evil king. They gave geopolitical analysis. So they said, you're leading us into disaster. You, uh, you should uh, be merciful to widows and orphans. And, uh, these are dissident intellectuals. How were they treated? Uh, they were imprisoned, uh, thrown into the desert. Uh, one of them, Elijah, uh, was called a hater of Israel, a <coughs> fair Israel, by uh, uh, the epitome of evil in the Bible, King Ahab. That's the first use that I know of this notion, self-hating Jew. You know, it's King Ahab referring to the prophet oh, yeah. Elijah. You know, and uh, 
the, uh, and they were all treated badly. Ooh. Now, there were people who were treated well, flatterers at the court. A couple of centuries later, they were condemned as false prophets. And that's very typical. But In I've fact, heard, I don't know of a society where that's not true. But I've heard it said, just on this point about you, that if the argument of, that you've just advanced in manufacturing, manufacturing consent was completely right, the book should have gone nowhere and you should have been an obscure figure who was shoved to the margins. But the fact that you are this giant figure and the book is still cited and quoted... Not because of me, it's because of the popular movement. If the, uh, when I started giving talks about the Vietnam War, in early 1960s, I, uh, I was giving talks in somebody's living room or um, a church with uh, four people, the minister, the organizer, a guy who wanted to kill me and a drunk who walked into the, off the streets. And that went on for quite a while. Finally, a popular movement developed. And when popular de movements develop, people who have some degree of privilege uh, can float above them. Actually, the same was true of Martin Luther King. I'm sure he would have been the first to say if, uh, if it hadn't been for uh, young students sitting in on lunch counters and riding freedom buses and getting the, beaten to a pulp by state troopers and everything that grew from that, he wouldn't have, nobody would have heard him either. Let's just, I said to you that we were going to just challenge a few things about it. The book was written in 1988. Since then, uh, we've had this explosion of other media, social media, uh, the internet, obviously, and access is now available to many who would at least consider themselves, and I want to hear if you, if they, if you think they would be right, that they would consider themselves outside the corporate media. They have their own voices, separate to that exchange and need for advertising, etc. And in fact, just to illustrate the point, I tweeted earlier today that I was going to have this conversation with you and uh, elicited this question from a Chris Wood here in Britain who said, can we still talk about dominance or hegemony in a world where there are so many competing sources of information and propaganda, the internet and blogs and Twitter, etc.? Does that, does this change in the last 25 years render any part of your thesis change, out of date? It's not a great change. Like when I was growing up in the 1930s, uh, there were uh, all sorts of uh, radical newspapers, I mean, every imaginable kind. In fact, as a kid, I'd go down to the Philadelphia Public Library, or analog to this, not the same, obviously, and uh, spend Saturday afternoon reading radical periodicals. Uh, every imaginable kind. And I got, you know, the, the, you know what they were like. But, but they were other interpretations. Now, sources of information is not exactly correct uh, because the, uh, the internet access makes that easier. Like, I don't have to go downtown to the library. I can punch something on my computer. Uh, but it's not that different. And uh, they are not really sources of information. Uh, the information is still coming from journalists in the field. But is that right? Because so I'm thinking of some of the, in the Arab awakenings, the, in Egypt and other places, people were reporting as eyewitnesses immediately in real that's time. Right. It wasn't going through the filter of any journalist. Well, that's how we found out about it. But uh, if you take a look, the internet was used for, or and social media were used for organizing in Tahrir Square. But take a look at what happened when... Uh, Mubarak tried to stop it by closing down the internet. It turned out it accelerated it because people just contact one another in other ways. But that's face a to face. that is a profound change, isn't it? Because there you're saying that the authoritarian who in the past could have shut down the six state newspapers, yeah, he couldn't people, shut down if that. If they had, then people would have reacted the same way by face-to-face -face communication. You've got lots of ways of communicating. And that's just what they did in Tahrir Square. In fact, it didn't... It didn't even hinder the de uh, demonstrations. So you don't feel that we're in, it's in any way made a, a change in sort it's of a change, can, but, uh, but, but but not in do, I, I think but not in kind. I mean, it's in degree, much less of a change than, say, from uh, the creation of libraries. I mean, that was a much bigger change. Uh, that uh, gave people access to huge amounts of material that before that they couldn't have. Uh, in comparison, the Internet is a small change, and uh, which is fine. I, I use it all the time. I'm not criticizing it. Uh, but it's a little different from libraries, crucially different. In the case of libraries, you could be uh, uh, pretty confident that uh, what you would read in the library is 
more or less serious. Uh, it had some value, otherwise it wouldn't have been preserved and stayed there. And when you look at the internet, uh, an awful lot of it is just total garbage. And if you, if you approach it without any framework of understanding, which is what happens quite often, uh, it can just be a source of deception. You get that's how a lot of contemporary cults develop. And you don't. You, I know you told me before that you consider yourself a technophobe. You don't use social media yourself. I don't use social media at all. I don't like them for other reasons. It seems to me they're <coughs> they create. I can see with my grandchildren. You know, they create very uh, superficial appearances of uh, relationships. You know, like a kid thinking of a case will write on Facebook, uh, you know, I'm having an exam this afternoon, and immediately a hundred fr so-called friends will write back, who she never heard from, saying, uh, gee, I, I hope, it, hope you do well. And uh, the kid thinks she has a hundred friends. There's nothing, you know. It's just uh, replacing real friends by uh, virtual friends. For somebody who doesn't use social media, I think you've got quite a good grasp of the teenage thing going on. There. I've got experimental subjects. <laughs> In the form of your there, there's, I should I promise that we are going to open this out um, for, to wider conversation and soon. There's a couple of areas I just want to probe before we do. Another change that's happened besides the internet change has been a kind of fragmentation of the big media that you were talk that was still there in a, in a big way in 1988. Uh, decline of the big city newspapers would be one phenomenon. But, for example, cable television. So there is now Fox News on the right and, uh, and an MSNBC News on the left. That feels like a proliferation, a, a, a range of views. Or for you, are they just two heads of the same corporate well, beast? I, I think if you look over the last, um, say, my lifetime, last uh, my conscious lifetime, last 70 years, say, there's been a narrowing of media, sharp narrowing in England, too. Uh, remember that as late as the 1960s, uh, the British tabloids, which, you know, beyond junk, were serious newspapers, mainly labor newspapers, and pretty serious ones. Uh, the New York Post, which is a tabloid, uh, that was the left-wing newspaper. Now it's uh, beyond idiocy. Uh, the Daily Herald, I think it was, was the best-selling newspaper in England until the early 60s. It was a social democratic labor newspaper. It also had a lot of uh, loyalty, reader loyalty. People read it and was serious. It couldn't uh, survive uh, capital concentration and advertising. And in fact, if you look back from the 19th century to till today, uh, there's been a sharp narrowing of media. In the 19th century, there was a huge proliferation of media. Uh, labor press, uh, ethnic press, all kinds of things. But all these things are now there, aren't they, on the internet? Mm -hmm. as, but all these things are there now, aren't they, on the internet as blogs for every no. possible political well, but strand? Well, then they were actually, they were serious newspapers that people participated in. And it wasn't just uh, anything that comes to mind, I'll write it down. Uh, they were committed, and they're very interesting. If you, I've, uh, in fact, if uh, there's a very good book, which maybe some of you have read, by, on the... Uh, reading Habits of the British Working Class, uh, Jonathan Rose, you know, big 800-page book. And it's, it's fascinating. Uh, he points out, he concludes, that uh, working people in England were, had a richer cultural life than the aristocrats because they were really reading uh, serious work. The same in the United States. You take a look at the labor press in the late 19th century. Uh, the press was written by you know, Irish artisans from going to the mills, uh, what they called factory girls, uh, young women from the farms who were essentially being driven into the mills as the early Industrial Revolution. And it's, it's very interesting, very insightful, very, uh, very uh, for them, uh, there was no Marx, no European socialism, never heard about that. They were just writing from their own experience of... Uh, the degrading character of the industrial system, which was destroying their culture, their independence, their freedom. In fact, one of the interesting things which is relevant, one, one of the things they denounced was what they called, this is 1850, 
of the new spirit of the age, uh, gain wealth forgetting all but self. Did you ever hear that? Now, that was the new spirit of the age in 1850, and uh, they were bitterly condemning it. And uh, there's been a 150 years of intense propaganda to get this sociopathic concept into people's heads. Uh, they were resisting it, uh, much less now. And, uh, and, and, and even in my childhood, there was still a, a wide proliferation of newspapers. I mean, in Philadelphia, where I lived, there were, uh, there was, in those days, there was a morning paper and an evening paper, and then you got mm. the New York papers. And it was quite a range. Well, that's certainly countercultural, that view, that we, the media have narrowed rather than widened. Let me just get your quick responses on, on, on three things, and then we're going to open it up. The first one is something going on in Britain at the moment. Part of the thesis of manufacturing consent is that there is this convergence between the politics and the corporate interest. Right now, more or less as you landed here, there is this proposal from the government, in fact from all the political parties, to have a form of regulation that will be underpinned or backed by law, so the state. And on the other hand, the people opposing it are the big corporate newspaper groups. And there's this divergence of interest. And each one says they're doing the right thing. And the corporate business voice says, we're speaking for freedom of expression. Given that you lump the two together, you fuse the together in the argument, who, where do you stand with this argument? Who's right in this argument? Well, you know, I haven't read the report yet, so I really can't comment. In fact, I don't I even think it's published. I wouldn't hold you but, back yeah. in this environment. Yeah. But, uh, so I can't comment <laughs> on it if it's even published. But divergences between the corporate sector and the state are extremely interesting, and they do happen on major issues. Um, and they're very revealing, and the way intellectuals and the media deal with them is revealing. Uh, so take, for example, uh, uh, the US uh, crusade against Cuba. Uh, it's been going on for 50 years in virtually total isolation. The United States has practically been kicked out of the Western Hemisphere because of it, because there's so much opposition. Uh, when it comes up in the United Nations, the votes are, you know, 180 to 2, United States and Israel. Uh, if you take a look at, uh, it's very vicious. It includes a lot of terrorism, serious terrorism, uh, uh, strangulation of the economy, you know. Uh, and it goes back to Kennedy, who was kind of insane about it. And it's persisted. And there's two interesting things about this. Uh, public opinion on this has been studied for about 40 years. Uh, the public is overwhelmingly in favor of normalization. Okay, it's normal for public opinion to be disregarded. That's what we call democracy. Uh, but it's, <laughs> what's interesting in this case is that the corporate sector is opposed. Mm. Big sectors of it, uh, agribusiness, uh, energy, pharmaceuticals. I mean, these are the guys who usually set policy, and they're opposed to it. But the state interest in punishing disobedience overwhelms uh, the pressure from the corporate sector. Uh, I think that tells us something about international affairs. And it says something about the... Because some people, if they crudely summarise your politics, would say you imagine the politicians are merely the uh, tools of corporate interest. And here's an example where they are sovereign. They're making a decision a against corporate interest. sometimes transcendent state interests. Uh, it's not so much Congress, it's the executive. And they see themselves mostly as um, responsible for the overall uh, health of the corporate system, not the parochial interests of particular corporations. And uh, for them, it's a crucial uh, necessity, and this runs right through the Cold War and much earlier, uh, to treat the world kind of like the mafia. In fact, I think that's the major principle of international affairs. You don't read it in journals, but I think international affairs can very well be, a lot of it can be understood on the mafia model. Uh, the godfather does not brook disobedience. Uh, if some small grocer uh, doesn't pay protection money, which the godfather wouldn't even notice, uh, they don't accept that. And they don't send the goons in to get the money. They get the goons in to beat them to a pulp. So others will understand that disobedience is not tolerated. And what would be an example of that in international affairs? Cuba. If you take a look at the actual, it's a very free country, the United States. We have rich, uh, 
documentary record. Nobody looks at it, so it doesn't matter much. But if you look at it, it uh, it's very revealing. So um, uh, the primary concern about Cuba under Kennedy was what they called successful defiance of uh, U.S. policy going back to the Monroe Doctrine in 1823. Uh, no Russians, uh, just the principle that uh, the hemisphere has to be obedient to us. And these guys are not only defying it, but they're getting away with it. You've just mentioned there that you said, you've conceded, if you like, the United States is a very free country. Uh, you've talked before elsewhere about the so-called freedom of expression in the United States. There's a lot of debate going on about the United States being in decline and its place, losing its place, to perhaps to China. Well, I mean, how do you, maybe don't get into the question of whether the US is going to be overtaken, but more narrowly, how the United States freedom of expression and propaganda compares to other countries? Is, there, is the propaganda less coercive in the United States than it is, say, in China? Is there, is there freer expression? Much more sophisticated. Go on. In fact, uh, some of these images illustrate it. Uh, uh, US commercial propaganda, which grew out of the uh, wartime experience of this great success and what, what they call a manufacturing consent. That's not our term. We took it from an intellectual, uh, Walter Lippmann, leading public intellectual. It was very successful. At, uh, out of that grew the public relations industry. Its guru came out of the uh, propaganda commission in the First World War. And very impressed. And uh, uh, then uh, commercial, propaganda, commercial advertising was created. Now, it was called propaganda then. So the founding uh, document of the public relations industry written in the late 20s by Edward Bernays was uh, he was uh, someone who had been in Wilson's propaganda commission. He called his book Propaganda. And it's uh, about, it's, uh, it, it gives the standard doctrines of the intellectual classes. Uh, the uh, which goes back to the English Civil War. Uh, the people are a rabble. They're stupid and ignorant. Uh, they're meddlesome um, outsiders, I'm quoting. And uh, for their own benefit, uh, we have to take care of them. It's straight out of Lenin. It's almost identical with Leninist vanguardism. The people don't understand. Uh, we're the responsible men. We understand. And for their benefit, we have to engineer consent. We have to control the minds of the people so that they uh, do the right thing. Uh, and that's our task. That's what propaganda is for, whether it's state or commercial. And uh, the commercial cases were kind of interesting. Bernays himself made his reputation and became a great figure because of the first major advertising campaign that he ran. Uh, in those days, this is 1920s, uh, women didn't smoke. And uh, mm. uh, the, you know, the manufacturers realized there's a big market out there they're losing. So he was hired to uh, convince women to smoke. And he ran campaigns in which uh, you know, models would walk down Fifth Avenue holding cigarettes and presenting the image. You want to be cool and modern. You, know, you should like the models. You should smoke. Uh, I don't know how many tens of millions of corpses he created, but he became a liberal hero for this. Uh, that's what commercial advertising was then until today, and it was very much admired. Uh, Goebbels uh, uh, picked up, he was very impressed by American commercial propaganda, uh, propaganda. it was called propaganda, advertising we call it now. Uh, and in fact, the Nazi propaganda was modeled on it. And he describes in detail how Goebbels, how you know, uh, these simple images, you know, appeal to the emotions, uh, you know, all that, and the Nazis uh, picked it up and ran with it. Now the Bolsheviks tried, and that Bolshevik picture is an example, but they were too crude to get away with it. Uh, so the Bolshevik propaganda, you can barely believe. But given the sophistication of it, and you use the word sophistication, does that mean? What? You said how sophisticated it operates in the United States, but does it mean that you would trust information that you got in the American media less than information you would read in the Chinese media, for oh, example? Chinese media is a joke. I mean, I, I was in China a couple of years ago, and uh, I, mean, I can't read Chinese, but they have a 
an, an English newspaper, and you can kind of watch television and figure out what they're talking about. Uh, well, anything in, written was so comical, you couldn't believe it. But what was interesting was what they didn't report. Uh, when I got back to the United States after a week in China, I discovered that there had been a massive traffic jam from Mongolia to Beijing <laughs> with trucks sitting there for days uh, because they couldn't get through. It was, it was, nobody knew about it. There wasn't a word about it there. I found out when I came back. So for all your criticisms of the American media, there is still, there's still value in it. You still regard it as free, free relatively. It's you would say free it's because there's, the United States has very little government coercion, but it has enormous obedience, which is kind of striking. Uh, the, and I think that uh, relates to what I said about the intellectual classes. There, there's no coercion at all. Um, the only coercion is, you know, maybe you won't get a good review or something. But uh, it's not like being sent to a torture chamber. Okay, well, I'm, gl I'm glad you made the distinction. Before we open it up, I, 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 I wanted to cite another response that came in when I offered uh, people on Twitter to suggest questions to you. And one of them was this uh, about Serb propaganda in the yeah. Serb propaganda. Serb, Serb as in propaganda. Serbian, yeah. yeah. And the question was, the, the suggestion was that I should ask you, why did he endorse Serb propaganda and imply the Omaska and Tronoplolie camps were invented? Shameful, said this person on Twitter. And it was actually the person sending it was somebody who had themselves lived in Sarajevo during the siege of Sarajevo who said, I was in Sarajevo at the time, I could see very well from where mortars and bullets were coming, etc. Now you know you've had this battle with a few people publicly. Well, with uh, not. I never said anything about the Balkans, but uh, I, I wrote about Kosovo, but said practically nothing about the Balkans. Uh, but uh, I don't understand exactly what was said. He says we accepted their propaganda. No, the criticism was that you had, oh, I um, have, no, I never and, said uh, and and the particular claim, as you know, centres on Srebrenica. And the, and the no, idea that you have no, cast no. doubt on Srebrenica, you've no, I you, didn't. What I said say, is say your piece on what it. I did, what I said is you should tell the truth about it instead of lying. Uh, and I do believe <coughs> that. I think it's useful to tell the truth. Uh, what happened in England, particularly uh, in the early 90s, was quite dramatic. I mean, British journalists and intellectuals seized on the Serb atrocities, which were real, uh, with just love. I mean, finally they had a chance to condemn somebody else and uh, seem very noble by agreeing with 100% of opinion. And that's irresistible. And you start getting a ludicrous propaganda coming out, including uh, the left press. And it, it just became a passion. You couldn't tell the truth about it. Uh, so... Uh, so on Sre when Srebrenica, you said you, it's important to tell the truth. No, I mean, the, tell the truth. Those, those journalists who were there, who reported on it, uh, believed they, the truth was that this was well, a massacre. Well, first of all, there, there really weren't journalists there. They, rep they reported afterwards. And but what, what's, what do you say is the truth, then, of what happened? The truth is that, uh, well, the truth is, if you want to go back a few months, that uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, armies, of the Bosnian armies, uh, sir, sir, um, uh, Srebrenica was a protected base, theoretically. It was so nobody could get in, presumably. And the, the um, uh, uh, Muslim armies were using it as a base to attack Serbian villages outside. And they were very frank and open about it. Uh, Nasser Orich, the head of the militias, uh, uh, bragged to the press, it was reported in the United States and the uh, Washington Post and so on, that he was sending his troops out into the Serb villages and beheading people and torturing them. And then they'd go back into the safe zone. Well, you know, it's pretty clear that sooner or later there's going to be a response to this. Now, what he then did was pull out his militias. And when the Serbs came in, which they did in reaction, uh, they were kind of surprised. There was no military defense. And then they carried out a lot of atrocities. The Serb forces did. The Serb, yeah, you know, we don't. I mean, it's called genocide. And I don't use the word genocide much. I think it's, the way it's used strikes me as a kind of Holocaust denial. I mean, to use genocide when you kill a bunch of people you don't like, that demeans the victims of the Holocaust, I think, is 
So I rarely use the word. I don't think it's used properly. But to kill, say, a couple of thousand men in a village and after you've allowed the women and children to escape, in fact, truck them out, uh, that doesn't count as genocide. It's a horror story, but it's not genocide. And you say a couple of thousand. I mean, people claim and would argue that the figure is much higher than that. Well, I mean, the figure figure figures are debated, but then you don't really know. I mean, the highest figures that are given are around 8,000. Uh, but it's not from... Uh, there's been an intensive effort to... Uh, when enemies carry out an atrocity, there's huge effort that goes into finding every piece of a bone and uh, the DNA analysis and try to get the biggest number you can. When we carry out a comparable atrocity, no, we even investigate. And, and the Bosnian but, woman who wrote to me on Twitter said that you were often cited, she said, by Serb propaganda. That Ch no, Professor Chomsky agrees with us. No, I never does, cite does that trouble you if you were being held up, prayed in aid by the Serbs? No, you can't. Not a, like I'm, I'm quoted by Iranian propaganda because I say things critical about the United States. You can't help that. Uh, it's, uh, I can't help what they do, but I think we ought to tell the truth about it. And the truth is, it was an atrocity, but uh, uh, nothing like what is claimed in, say, the British press. Bad atrocity. And uh, this is also true of the camps. That's an interesting story. And uh, uh, there were a couple of uh, detention and concentration camps. Uh, the uh, uh, first one that was investigated uh, was uh, a Guardian reporter, Ed Villami, and uh, some ITN uh, yes. uh, TV people. And uh, they reported on this camp, which they described as a detention camp. They pointed out that you weren't forced to stay there. You could read the early reports, uh, the eyewitness reports. Uh, people could get out if you wanted. They were holding them there, but not a concentration camp. Uh, later, the story changed. It became Auschwitz. Same journalists, incidentally, uh, reported as kind of uh, Auschwitz in Europe. They just changed the story, not on the basis of new evidence. It's just the mood changed. There was a small newspaper, kind of crazy newspaper, uh, LM it was called, yes. which had four people or something. Uh, they sent a photographer uh, to the camps who took photographs and essentially confirmed the original story. Uh, You're not claiming the original story was faked? Oh, no. I think it was an eyewitness story. A reporter gives an eyewitness description. It's usually true. Okay. You know? So I assume it was true. It's British reporters. Uh, then what happened is interesting. Uh, ITN and The Guardian, incidentally, went after LM in order to destroy it. And they relied on these utterly scandalous British libel laws, which are an international scandal, uh, and do make it possible for a big corporation to put a tiny newspaper out of business. They can't pay the legal costs and so on. And then there was a euphoria about it. They said, great, we managed to put out of business a tiny newspaper which published something we don't like. Okay. But then something else happened. Uh, the most respected photojournalist, maybe anywhere, certainly here, Philip Knightley, looked into it. And uh, he's a, you know, has very respected work, goes back to the Spanish Civil War. And he did an analysis, and uh, he concluded that the LM uh, analysis was probably correct. He didn't accuse anyone of distortion. He just said, if you look at, uh, if you look at it, it's probably correct. He also wrote a very interesting article to the Briti addressed to the British journalists said you ought to learn something about freedom of the press. Okay, um, I, 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 I'm just because no, I, I don't to think either of his things was ever published. No, the, I was just going to say for the, for the record, obviously ITN and The Guardian would say that they'd been accused of faking evidence and therefore they I'm had to respond they very faked it. He strongly. Did, no, he I mean about Ellen. But also, the, and just before we open up, and you know, George Monbiot, somebody who admires you tremendously in every area, says just on this issue he feels you're just on the wrong side. But, yeah. but, you've, but, but you've I'd like to see some arguments. But let's, let's see, because obviously we, we've got bigger themes and topics here. Um, I, but it might be a good idea to bring up the, uh, the lights a little bit. I don't mean bigger themes, but other themes. Um, let's uh, take some questions for Professor Chomsky. I think we started a few minutes late, so I'm going to uh, give, give us some added time. Um,
gentleman here had his hand up early. If there's a microphone that can go there uh, in this front row, and um, are you somebody with a microphone, or you just want to say ask something? You're already standing up. That's very uh, enthusiastic. Is there a second microphone that we can get? So why don't we get it to the uh, person who's already on his feet? Yeah, no, we'll take two or three at a time. Uh, Professor Chomsky, thank you for your remarks. I report on the environment and I'm interested in language about the environment. So we have a consistent uh, narrative in this country about the notion of limitless growth. Um, it, th this is almost unchallenged, uh, the thought that we can carry on growing forever. Uh, recently, David Cameron talked about us being in a global race and we had to be among the winners, but nobody asked who the losers would be and when the race would ever end. Um, I'm just wondering in this case whether it's a question of manufactured consent or just the lack of a good alternative. Well, I Thank you. I'm going to take two or three at a time. Yeah, so okay. I'll, I'll bring the question back. Um, exemplary question from our colleague from the BBC, but we need them to be shorter than that if we're going to get through lots. Um, so okay. no, no, brevity from you, if you can, yeah. Hello, Professor Shamsky. Thank you very much for uh, being here. Enjoy your work. Um, yeah, we're going to have to give okay, okay. to those sort of things. Um, all right, well, my question to... is a little bit more specific about uh, uh, exploitation of the third world. Like, say, um, I'm not too sure how many people in the room has an iPhone or, like, say, night trainers, which I'm wearing. So um, my question basically is, shall we just improve the working standard of, like, say, uh, you know, kids who are making our iPhones and shoes in China uh, or in various other countries? Um, for us to basically keep checking our Facebook, all right? Um, or um, should we just throw our, all, all our iPhones away and, okay. um, and yeah. Good, thank you, <laughs> I got that, and I'll, I'll repeat it back to the professor when we're here. Um, have we got the microphone for this questioner here? And maybe we'll get one more in, and we'll do lots of rounds, so don't worry, yeah. Short question, what are your thoughts about the rise of Ch Chinese power on the world stage, please? Good. And you were about to begin on that, and I sort of prevented you. And why don't we just tack on one more, since the microphone's there. Yeah, we'll get, we'll hear from you at the back. Yeah, hi. Uh, no, thank you very much for um, coming. I wanted to ask you a question. Earlier, I think you um, referred to a uh, comparison between the, internet, sorry, hearing, between the internet and libraries. But I was just thinking to myself, as you were saying that, isn't the comparison a little bit closer? They are connected, but a little bit closer to the development of the printing press. And isn't the nature of improvement of things to become more valid information helped by that? Because people will then start speaking to each other, communicating scientific articles and stuff, which will drive up developments. You've written some really interesting stuff, but it's become more interesting over time because people have said it's rubbish or it's only partly right or whatever, and you've had to adapt to that and develop it. Um, and then the libraries have become full of much more valid, uh, truthful... Thank you. Speak Good. I, I, I'm going to... Um, don't worry, we're going to have other rounds, and I will come back to you, so uh, do that. Um, so we'll, why don't we um, just go with that last question. The questioner uh, said that you had in some way said that the internet was not such a profound change, that the library was a much bigger change. And he was saying, actually, that maybe this is akin more to the printing press, uh, the invention of the printing press, and that actually it would improve quality of ideas and debate because people will share and exchange ideas globally in a way they couldn't do before. Well, the, the printing press was a huge change. I mean, it dwarfs anything we're talking about. Uh, the, uh, the libraries were a major change. Uh, the internet, from this point of view, is a small change and has uh, mixed effects, uh, as I mentioned, that there's... Uh, no qu quality control, peer review, which is okay. People should be able to say anything they want, but it makes it uh, much less useful than, say, a library as a source of information. Now, the interchange of ideas is fine, but, uh, you know, we had... I mean, take, say, interchange of ideas between Britain and the United States, two countries that were pretty close. Uh, the biggest uh, change in that kind of interchange it came when sailing ships were replaced by steamboats uh, or by the telegraph. It meant in it's 19th century, instead of waiting uh, several months to get an answer to a letter, the uh, telegraph, you get it instantly. Uh, um, steamboats, pretty much. And uh, now it's faster, but it's 
if you think about it in terms of increments, it's not huge. It's not as much as the others. Instantly, that's true of many other things. So, say, the, the invention of indoor plumbing had a much bigger effect on health standards than modern medicine. It's, uh, all these things are fine, you know, but uh, we shouldn't uh, exaggerate. So Google and, get to the back of the queue behind the toilet. Yeah. It's basically yeah. the argument. But the, uh, um, I, th I think that covers the ground that, you, um, that you'd also spoken about earlier. I wanted to push you on the next point, because I cut you off. You were about this China and US decline thesis. Yeah. The questioner asked about the rise of China well, and what you think about of, that, and particularly in relevant talk, to pop propaganda. It's very common to talk about US decline. In fact, you read the main foreign policy journals. It's one of the main topics. Is America over, America decline? Well, first of all, we should put that in perspective. Uh, the peak of American power was in 1945. At that point, the US uh, totally dominated the world. It had half the world's wealth. Uh, it gained a lot during the Second World War. Industrial production quadrupled. Uh, every possible competitor was devastated or destroyed. The security situation was incomparable. It was just enormous power. And American planners understood it, and they laid plans to how to run the world and go through it. It's quite sophisticated <laughs> and interesting. Well, that started to decline within four years. Uh, one of the plans was that the U.S. would control all of Asia. That's why other countries were not permitted to participate in the uh, San Francisco Peace Treaty, the Japan Peace Treaty. And most of the Asian countries refused to participate, except Ceylon, I think, you know, Sri Lanka, British colony at the time, uh, because the US insisted that the only Japanese crimes should be from 1941 on. And they had already fought 10 years of war under uh, Japanese imperialism. Those were the worst crimes. But Just the whole thing. Specifically on China. Be okay, the let's talk about US China. Uh, that was 1949. Uh, that was 45. In 1949, a very significant event occurred. Uh, it's called the loss of China. Uh, chi China was supposed to be a part of the American empire. And uh, this event, uh, China moved to independence. Actually, the, the phrase is interesting. Like, I can't lose your computer, right? Uh, I can lose my computer. Mm -hmm. But the loss of China means we own it, obviously. In fact, we own the world, and we lost it. And then one of the big issues in American domestic politics ever since then is who's responsible for the loss of China? You know, uh, uh, well, uh, nobody even questions that. It's a good example of how good propaganda really works. It presupposes that we own the world, and then you discuss things within that assumption. And it goes on like that, the loss of Indochina, you know, mm. on loss of the Middle East, and so on. Uh, so that was a, a and, ever, and you know, the, the decline continued. The world got more complicated. Now let's talk about China. Uh, China has uh, last, it's had a spectacular growth rate. It's a very poor country. Uh, you take a look at the Human Development Index, UN. Uh, last time I looked, I think it was 90th. Uh, uh, all the Western countries are way up on top. It's, uh, it's got enormous internal problems, uh, ecological problems. Uh, 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 it's got a, a very uh, militant labor movement, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of la <coughs> <coughs> labor actions every year protesting the repression. It's a major exporter, manufacturing exporter. But take a close look. It's mostly an assembly plant. So if you buy a, you know, an iPad or one of those things, it's assembled in China. And it's called a Chinese export. But the value added in China is very slight. It almost all comes from the surrounding industrial countries in Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, and the West. And, uh, you know, slowly China will move up the technology ladder, and in some domains they've actually done it. So, you, so you're sounding a sceptical note there about this rise of China. It's but, real. But you've been a critic all your working life of American imperialism and American domination. If, and I know it's obviously from what you've just said a big if, yeah. 
that if China does eventually overtake, would it be better to live in a China-dominated world than it's been to live in a US-dominated world? Uh, it's, uh, it's like asking about a Martian-dominated world. It is so remote from reality that there's not much point thinking about it. But do you, you've obviously been a critic of US imperialism, and so I'm just imagining a world without US imperialism. Is that Martian? Does that ever happen? I, I don't think it's in the cards. I mean, US decline has continued. The world, world power is much more diverse now than it was in the past. In fact, the biggest part of American decline is quite striking, is uh, what they call the loss of Latin America. I mean, Latin America was supposed to be in the back pocket. That's the backyard. They do whatever we say. Uh, now, uh, Latin America has become remarkably independent. In fact, there was a case a couple of weeks ago, uh, which I didn't see, maybe it was coverage here, I didn't see it. Uh, it was, what happened was reported, but not its meaning. Uh, there was a study that came out by the Open Society Institute of, uh, called Globalizing Torture of Rendition, which is a terrible crime. And it studied the, the countries that participated in the US globalizing torture campaign. Well, it included most of Europe, included England, included Sweden, and so on. It included the Middle East, because that's where uh, the people were sent to be tortured by the dictatorships. It included Asia, it included Africa. One continent was totally missing. Not a single Latin American country was willing to participate. And this is doubly significant. For one thing, that was always, as I said, the backyard. They did what we said. And furthermore, as long as the US ran it, it was the torture capital of the world. That's just 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. Now it pulled totally free. Uh, it's interesting the way that's interpreted in the literature. Uh, so there's, a, there's an article coming out in Foreign Affairs, uh, you know, the main establishment journal, by uh, one of the, Michael Shifter, one of the leading specialists on Latin America. Uh, he describes how up till 20 years ago, everything was going wonderfully in Latin America. The countries were modernizing. They accepted the Washington Consensus. In fact, they were getting ruined, but forget about that. Uh, in fact, they were revolting against it. So everything was going great. They were moving towards democracy and markets and uh, under the benign influence of the United States. And then something bad happened. An evil demon appeared, Hugo Chavez, and he destroyed everything. Because of him, Latin America is going off in this crazy direction. They don't even, part he didn't say this, but they don't participate in globalizing torture and so on. Now, Chavez is regarded as an evil demon in the Western press. In fact, the coverage of Chavez is astonishing. It's, uh, and there's plenty to criticize, not criticized it, but he is, uh, the treatment of his is like, uh, I don't know what, Hitler or something like that. It's to the extent that the, uh, the, the ceremony at the, uh, you know, the funeral, uh, if you read the American press, it says what a terrible guy he is, uh, the funeral, uh, Ahmadinejad yes. showed up and all these bad guys. You're the one who compared him to Reagan, which is I don't know whether he's ever going to recover from that. No. But, but, but I want to get, you on, I want to get your question answered to that question. What actually happened is that every country in the Western Hemisphere except the US and Canada, sent the president, most of them yes. declared days of mourning, and uh, Lula the, uh, sure. the, wrote a, a very supportive comment on him. Uh, this is all the right-wing presidents, Pinera, Santos, and others. Uh, the US sent a delegation, in which the leading member was a nice guy. He's a former congressman, a former congressman, House of Representatives, who, I was kind of involved in Latin America. That's the U.S. delegation. Mm. Uh, the dictator, you know, all, the, all of our clients sent uh, presidents and declared days of mourning. But uh, try to find something about this. Let, let's just get you on these two questions, which I'm going to link. The first one was about limitless growth and the, the, the idea that that, despite the impact that is going to have on the climate and on the environment, has that too, is that too an example of manufactured consent? And I think it links a little bit with this point about our desire for, and this is the question I think you didn't quite hear, but the desire for iPhones and Nike trainers, etc., means that we are exploiting uh, labour 
in uh, China and other places. And, and I think the question was asking advice, really. What should we do? Should we demand improved standards or should we just stop buying those kind of goods? But they're, they're, they're both questions that relate, I think, to this global pursuit of growth. And, and what do you well, think? the first question about the environment is probably the most important question there is. I mean, uh, the human species has come to a point where it can and probably will uh, destroy the possibility for decent survival. And it's not that remote, you know, our, our grandchildren. Uh, and it's pretty, se pretty severe. And there's an overwhelming consensus of scientists. Uh, uh, the consensus has consistently turned out to be too conservative. It's worse than they predicted. You can read the science journals every week. There's some new story about it. And uh, the effects are quite interesting. Uh, most of the, the, there's one out of 110 relevant countries, there's one that has no national program for the environment and has no uh, uh, program for renewable energy, national program, the United States. And is, uh, is, do, would this be another example of manufacturing well, consent, would you argue? The manufacturing consent is extremely interesting. Uh, it, uh, if you look at public opinion in the United States, there's a huge propaganda campaign in the United States, quite open, incidentally. Uh, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, the business uh, lobby, uh, petroleum industry, and so on, have announced that they're running a campaign, huge campaign, to convince Americans that it's all nonsense, that humans don't have anything to do with it, it's not happening anyway, and so on. And it's had a slight effect. Americans tend to be somewhat more skeptical of global warming and its consequences than other countries, but not a huge effect. The American population is much closer to the scientific consensus uh, than uh, the media and policy. Uh, and that's quite interesting. And it's led to, uh, there's a new campaign that's just underway uh, by an organization called the ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. It's a corporate lobby, heavily funded by corporations and Coach Brothers and all those nice guys. Uh, what they do is uh, write legislation for state legislatures to try to get state legislatures to accept legislation. And they're, they've got a lot of clout, so they get a lot of them in. You can imagine what they're about. They, they just start a new one. Uh, which is quite interesting from the point of view of propaganda. They're concerned about the fact that the American population is paying too much attention to the scientific consensus. So what the new program is designed to do uh, in the states, and a couple of states have already adopted it, is to introduce what they call balanced teaching in the K-12, to you know, kindergarten to 12th grade educational system. A balanced teaching means that along with teaching uh, the overwhelming consensus of scientists, uh, what every national academy says, what all the science journals says, along that, with that, uh, you teach uh, climate change denial. And that's balanced teaching. And it's in the interests of critical mm -hmm. education, you know, getting children to be critical and so on. You know. uh, well, that's, uh, it shows the desperation of the corporate propaganda system and its failure to drive the population totally off the uh, international spectrum. I mean, the public opinion, as I mentioned, doesn't affect policy much, so the United States has no policies in this respect, but uh, few, but... I, mean, I do want to get more people in. Do you yeah. have an answer to the, to the man who was asking about iPhones and things iPhones. that require exploited labor or underpaid labor, child labor well, even, um, in some places? Everything else does too, so, I mean, if you eat your dinner, you know, uh, a lot of it is coming from super exploited farm workers under horrible conditions. Uh, and uh, you can't look at anything in a capitalist system which doesn't involve extensive uh, exploitation. Whether we should have iPhones or not, I mean, I don't have one. But if people like them, okay, nothing wrong with it. Interesting. Uh, okay. However, the endless growth is a problem. The endless growth. Because, and in fact, it's quite interesting. Here's another thing which is not being discussed and should be. Uh, if there's ever a historian a uh, century from now, there may not be. But if 
if we don't succeed in destroying civilization, which we're trying hard to do, uh, and there are historians around, and they look back at what's happening now, they'll be astonished. I mean, the evidence for the climate problem, serious problem, maybe catastrophe is overwhelming. And there are various reactions to it. Uh, at one extreme, there are groups that are trying to do something about it. Uh, if you take a look, they're mostly indigenous societies, the uncivilized part of the world, uh, the Canadian First Nations, the uh, you know, Australian Aboriginals. Uh, uh, in Latin America, it's quite striking because there's a substantial indigenous population there. They didn't wipe them all out the way the English colonists did, were much more efficient. But uh, mm -hmm. so there's a pretty big indigenous population, and the countries that have uh, a strong indigenous uh, population, they're way in the lead in doing something about it. The most interesting case is Ecuador. Uh, under the pressure, of, it's an oil exporter, uh, but under the pressure of the indigenous communities, uh, Ecuador is the only oil exporter in the world that's trying to keep the oil in the ground. They're asking the European Union for aid to help them not lift the oil, keep it in the ground where it ought to be. I'm sure they're not going to get the aid, but at mm -hmm. least they're trying. You, know, you go to the richest countries, the United States and Canada, they are hell-bent on trying to make the crisis as bad as possible. You know, very enthusiastic about finding every imaginable way to uh, use fossil fuels and uh, let's go to disaster as quickly as possible. Well, that's, you know, that's what's happening in the world. There, there are things to say about this, but try to find them. Thank you. Let's just take a round here. We've got about 13 or 14 minutes left before we run out. So brief questions and we'll try and get brief answers too. Let's, where, who's got the microphone at the moment? Okay, you go first and we'll get the microphone down and then we're going to go to you. Yeah. Um, do you see the potential for anarcho-syndicalism to flourish once more as it did in Spain during the 1930s? And if um, so, a potential where? for what? I, I didn't uh, sorry, anarcho-syndicalism to flourish once more as it did in Spain in the 1930s. If so, where? Okay, um, that may be up your street. Um, that's, I mean, Professor Chomsky Street, yeah. Professor Chomsky, how would you explain the decline of popular participation in formal political processes in the West? I'm talking about lower voters turnouts, uh, decline in party membership and so on. What, how would you explain that? Thank you. Uh, I've got this, yeah. And um, somebody should have the microphone there now. Yes, given, given today's theme and Professor Chomsky's association with MIT, I wonder if he has any thoughts about the suicide <coughs> of Aaron Schwartz. Ah, OK. Um, can you, for people who are here, just give us a, in, in a sentence the, what the Aaron Schwartz story is, because I'd rather you summarise it than I do. Um, access to information. And, and, what, and just say in a sense who he was and what happened to him. Aaron Schwartz was um, an information activist in the United States who was uh, targeted by the United States government for downloading excessively on MIT's campus uh, journals from JSTOR. Yeah. Uh, and what happened to him? He killed himself. Thank you. That's why I wanted you to tell the story. That's it. Um, rather than me. Okay, and... Um, it's just a question of two parts. It was discussed how the media has massively narrowed in breadth between the 19th century and the present. Um, do you see this as part of a wider trend of reduced political innovation as a result of corporate pro propaganda? And then part two is, if so, how is it possible to subvert this trend? Okay, good. Um, and since we're, this may well be our last little go-round, we'll squeeze in a couple more and I'll try and sort of bunch them together. So the gentleman there has got his hand up. We've managed to get through the whole evening not talking about the Middle East. Could we have a quick pricey? <laughs> See? We were doing so well as well. Let's go on. There we are. If you dismiss the internet as a forum, how does a disempowered individual counterbalance the onslaught of mainstream propaganda. Thank you. And last one from here, yeah. Yes. Uh, talking about the, well, I mean, nowadays, for example, we don't have the helmet to deal with this dissidents, but I wonder if you could give us a, a contemporary example of how, for example, with the use of propaganda, uh, dissidents get silence. An example of how dissidents get silenced? Get silenced, yeah, with okay. the use of propaganda. Rather than of having fun. Yeah, perhaps a, a, a personal example. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's see if we can... 
I can think there's a couple there that pull together uh, well. The question that came in uh, two parts was talking about... Um, the second part of it was how is it possible to get round this narrowing that happens with the corporate influence over the media, etc. And there was a similarly one saying, if you are not that impressed by the internet, what then can an individual do to somehow circumvent to get round this trend that you've been describing? So I'm putting those two questions together. Well, first of all, I am impressed by the internet. I, actually, I was, it was developed in the lab where I was working in the 1950s and 60s. I remember that most of the high-tech culture comes out of the state sector. Uh, it was, uh, we don't have a capitalist system. We have a state sector which is dynamic. That's where the creative, inventive work uh, goes on. Now, the whole IT revolution, including the internet and computers and the rest of it, uh, most of it was developed in the state sector, places like MIT. In fact, the very building lab where I was working in the 50s and 60s. Uh, that's where the serious work was done. Uh, 30 years later, uh, roughly, it was handed over to a private enterprise so that uh, uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs could become rich, uh, uh, adapting the work that had been done to commercial uses. That's what we call capitalism in one of the many respects. Uh, so it's, and I, I appreciate it. I think it's very good. In fact, I even uh, had personal appreciation. My, I had a daughter in, who lived in Nicaragua during the Sandinista period, and uh, the United States was basically a war with Nicaragua, and there was no way to communicate, no mail service, uh, nothing. However, uh, there was the predecessor of the internet, the ARPANET, which was a military system, and I'm on it, because I'm at MIT, so I'm on it. And she managed to get uh, on it. So thanks to the Pentagon, <laughs> we were able to communicate during the US war against Nicaragua. <laughs> I like that. But, That's very uh, neat. but I use it all the time. You know, I look things up, I find things. Uh, uh, what can we do? We, we've, it, it's better than libraries, if you know what you're looking for. You know, worse if you don't know. And that's fine. Uh, and uh, we have, if we, want, if we want to do the hard work, uh, you can find access to all sorts of things. Uh, like uh, in the United States, substantially in England, to a lesser extent, uh, the country is free enough so that you have access, uh, very rich access to internal records. Now, that's invaluable. I mean, a lot of what I've just been saying comes out of internal records. And which what about, you what about urging people to use non-corporate owned media? I mean, representative of the BBC over there, the Guardian is not has an unusual well, and I, not conventional corporate structure. I mean, I, would you I, say that some of those are uh, yeah, ways to go? It's, it's, use, it's useful. I mean, like I read the Guardian, I read the Independent, but uh, the fact of the matter is that if I had one newspaper, I was stuck with one newspaper, I'd read the New York Times uh, because the coverage is so much broader and deeper when. I come to England, I, I have to buy five newspapers every morning. <laughs> uh, and you get, you put them together, you get a lot of things and a lot of junk, you know. I'm an immense amount of junk. Uh, but a lot of interesting things. But you sweat, stay with the New York Times even though your book is so critical of the New York Times, damning of the New York Times. But I, as I said, it's a, it's, a, it's a selective criticism. What reporters report is usually quite accurate, even though distorted in many ways. First of all, what they don't report, uh, which is just being part of an intellectual community that is so subservient to power you can't look at it, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, editorial discretion and other things. But it's a, a very good source. I read it every morning. Uh, the business press is very accurate and very reliable. Uh, the Wall Street, the Financial Times is, I think, a very good newspaper. The Wall Street Journal with American counterpart is so right-wing that when you read the editorials, you don't know whether to laugh or cry. Uh, on the other hand, the news reporting is quite good and often exposes a corporate crime and things like that. I think the reason is that, and that's generally true of the business press, Business Week and others, um, a couple of differences between the business press and the general press. For one thing, the business press trusts its audience. Uh, 
And uh, uh, another thing is uh, its audience are the guys who run the world. They better have a pretty fair picture of what's actually going on in the world. They, they, well, uh, there's a lot of other ways to do things. Yes, we're not short of information. But, so we're going to try and have to do this as yeah. short as we can because we've got so little time. <laughs> but there was a question there about what's your take to explain decline in party membership and in voter turnout in democratic countries around the world. There is a marked trend in that direction. What's it's your a very explanation? striking trend. And uh, incidentally, if you, um, uh, I think it's a reflection of the fact that democracy is collapsing. Uh, so people don't bother participating. Uh, so take the United States where it's been closely studied. I don't know if it's studied that much here, but uh, one of the main topics in professional uh, political science is studying attitudes. And you can do it very well in the United States. There's extensive polls, you know. A lot of them are pretty accurate and well constructed. So you find out a lot about attitudes. Uh, you can then uh, look at policy, because that's right in front of your eyes. And you can compare attitudes and policy. Uh, furthermore, a lot of the polls are stratified. So you learn you know, what the rich want and what the poor want. And when you put all this material together, I won't go through the details, it turns out in effect that about 70% of the population is almost totally disenfranchised. It doesn't matter what they think. Uh, the political class pays no attention to them. Uh, so, uh, so no wonder they're not taking part. So why bother going to the voting booth? Uh, and as you move up the income scale, you get more and more influence. The top, you essentially get everything you want. And you can see it in the big issues right at this moment. So if you take a look at American domestic politics, uh, the big issue is the deficit. You know, the sequesters, you know, practically closing down the government. We've got to do something about the deficit. Uh, who cares about the deficit? Not the population. The population doesn't think the deficit is a big issue. Uh, they think the big issue is lack of jobs. Uh, uh, not the business press. The business press thinks the deficit isn't a big problem. Uh, we should stimulate the economy, which you do with a bigger deficit. So it should be bigger, not smaller. Uh, the people that don't like the deficit are the wealthy and the banks, uh, the financial institutions. I mean, over the past 40 years, the financial institutions are mostly a drain on the economy, I think. They have become so powerful uh, that they very largely dominate what goes on in the political system. And if you look at, uh, there just came a study by two good political scientists looking at Comparing wealth with attitude toward the deficit, and a very close correlation. The richer you are, the more you compare, uh, care about the deficit. Mm -hmm. uh, financial institutions care about it. So therefore, that's the issue. It doesn't matter what the public wants. Uh, and <coughs> for reasons like this, and you can see it in polls. So when people are asked in polls in the United States, does Congress represent the population? Now, the figures run single digits, maybe 10%. Uh, so people have, have no faith in it. It yeah. doesn't have anything to do with us. In fact, one very dramatic illustration, which nobody ever talks about, but you should think about, is attitude toward taxes. Uh, in the United States on April 15th, you pay your taxes. In a functioning democratic society, uh, that would be a day of celebration. Uh, we're getting together to fund the projects that we decided on. In the United States, it's a day of mourning. An alien force is descending on us to <coughs> steal our money. It has nothing to do with us. In fact, attitude towards taxes is a pretty good index of the extent to which a democracy is functioning. And you can look at it and see yourself. So I think it's uh, reasonable and natural for people to stop participating. The I'm going to put together two other questions. There was some, we, somebody asked, uh, can you give an example of a sort of dissenter who is pushed aside by the system? The, and the example of Aaron Schwartz in your, uh, your own university in MIT, uh, you, what, just perhaps, it, it doesn't have to be a long answer on this one because yeah. we've got two more things I want to get in, but uh, okay. well, uh, do, do you have a, a response on that? On Aaron, well, it's well, not... And on dissent. It's, I mean, the number of dissenters who are pushed aside is it's almost universal and the one I'm... Either they're in jail or uh, if it's Latin America, they get their heads blown off. But in off. the United States, I think. In the United States, they're marginalized. 
uh, in various ways. The United States is a free country. You can't do in the United States what uh, was done to LM in England. It's not that a repressive a society. And there's more protection for freedom of speech. Uh, but uh, uh, they're essentially, uh, they can't get jobs, they're marginalized, they're vilified, all sorts of things. Not much punishment, frankly. But um, it's real. Uh, Aaron Schwartz is a different case and a very interesting one. If, I don't know if it was reported here, but uh, Aaron Schwartz was a very bright young kid, a hacker, uh, very, did very interesting work on uh, computers. And he was uh, part of the hacking community, which is in favor of uh, opening up all sources. And the way he went about it was uh, he broke into the MIT computer system and uh, what they call liberated JSTOR. JSTOR, for those of you who know, is a, it, it's a, it collects, it takes articles in professional journals and uh, libraries or individuals, they can do it, uh, subscribe to it, and then you can get internet access to uh, articles coming out in journals. So uh, Aaron, he's a not very nice kid. Um, he committed suicide. What, what happened is he, he broke into the MIT system. He freed up JSTOR. Uh, JSTOR called for uh, pressed MIT to do something about him. He was stealing their stuff. So they called the police. They didn't know who it was. They identified him. Uh, then the uh, federal prosecutor got involved, that was the state <coughs> prosecutor, and pr proposed a ridiculous <coughs> sentence. Should have been a misdemeanor or something. Uh, but she said, you know, I'm going to go to jail for 40 years or so. He committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was a plea bargain offered uh, that he uh, should agree to a jail <clears throat> sentence for a couple of months. And, uh, that would be, but the family didn't want that. And he committed suicide. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a terrible event. I mean, uh, everyone involved should have pressed the prosecutors not to do anything. Yeah. However, there's another issue which ought to be thought about that has to do with a freedom of information. If you take JSTOR and make it public, JSTOR goes out of business. We live in a capitalist society. Uh, they can't survive if they don't get subscriptions. If JSTOR goes out of business, nobody has access to the journals. So the next step is, okay, let's liberate the journals. In that case, the journals go out of business and nobody has anywhere to publish. Uh, that's, you can't just liberate things pretending you don't exist in the world. A lot of young kids think you can do that. They're not thinking it through. Well, there are ways around this, uh, but the ways around it involve collective action of the kind that doesn't fit with the new spirit of the age. Uh, what ought to happen is that there ought to be a public subsidy for creative work. Okay, then there wouldn't be any copyrights, uh, there wouldn't be patents, uh, a huge saving, incredible savings, and everything would be open. But that requires doing something together, and we're not allowed to do that. We have to be out for ourselves. You know. <clears throat> the very last thing is I'm going to give you a choice, since we've been talking about freedom partly. You can either take the question about anarcho-syndicalism and where it might pop up in the world. You have described yourself in some places as a, an anarchist or with anarchist leanings. So where might it come? Or you can <clears throat> give us a proxy of your views on the Middle East when we are already nine minutes over time. <laughs> so <laughs> the choice is entirely yours. Well, uh, the question about anarchism, I think there's a, there's a simple, inadequate, but simple answer. Uh, if you take a look at what anarchism has meant over the centuries, uh, it varies all over the place. It's very broad range, but there's one theme that runs through it, and I think it's an important one, and I think recognizing it, everyone ought to be an anarchist. Uh, the theme is that uh, uh, hierarchy, uh, domination, uh, control are not self-justifying. They require a justification, and that's true whether it's a patriarchal family or international society or anything in between. Now, if they can't give the just, the burden of proof is on those who exercise authority. If they can't give a justification, which is almost always, uh, then the system ought to be dismantled. In my view, that's anarchism. Then has a lot of variants. <laughs>
And I think it's a very powerful notion. A lot more to say about it, of course. Uh, on the Middle East, it depends what you're talking about. I mean, if, if you take a look at it, well, it's just for simplicity, let's take uh, US politics. Uh, most important country in the world. Uh, if you look at the presidential debate on foreign policy, mm. or you look at the Chuck Hagel hearing on defense, there were two names that came up far more than anything else in the world, uh, Israel and Iran. Uh, Israel, because uh, other countries were kind of mentioned, but marginally. Uh, Israel, because uh, both candidates had to show that they sort of vied for who loved it and worshipped it more. Uh, Iran, because it's the gravest threat to world peace. So those are the two that were discussed. And uh, interesting question is, what, uh, there are a lot of questions about why, what the U.S.-Israel relationship is. That would be too long to discuss. But the Iran one is quite interesting, uh, very interesting. And what's particularly interesting, it's not getting reported. In the United States, I've checked, not at all. You can tell me whether it's reported here. Let's say Iran's the greatest threat to world peace, okay? You could argue about it, but let's assume that it's true. Uh, what's the threat? The threat is that they might be developing a nuclear capability, which plenty of countries have. Uh, okay, so let's say that's not weapons, but capability. Uh, so what do you do? Let's grant that it's a threat. I might mention, incidentally, that that's a Western obsession. Outside of the United States, uh, England, and a couple of Euro European countries, it's not regarded as much of a threat. Non-aligned countries don't think so. The Arab world doesn't think so. It's a, it's a Western obsession, but let's accept it since we're here. Uh, what do you do about the threat? Well, there's a number of possibilities. There's some technical proposals that could be pursued. Uh, one of them, in fact, was implemented until it was blocked by the West. Uh, in May 2010, uh, Turkey and Brazil uh, made a deal with Iran in which Iran would ship its low-enriched uranium for storage to Turkey, and in return, the nuclear powers would provide Iran with the isotopes that it needs for its medical reactor. Okay, that would end the, th end the alleged threat. Uh, what happened when they uh, reached the deal? As soon as they made the deal and ended the gravest threat to world peace, uh, the Obama administration and the media trailing behind, as always, bitterly condemned Turkey and Brazil for breaking ranks. And Obama went off to the UN and tried to get harsher sanctions. Well, the Brazilian foreign minister was a bit annoyed with this, and he released a letter in which it's from Obama to President Lula, the president of Brazil, in which Obama had proposed this, probably assuming that Iran would reject it and win some propaganda points. Uh, then Iran accepted it, so you kill it. Is that a story here? I don't think it was reported the way you've just described okay. it. No. Well, that, that's what happened. I mean, it's not in doubt. There's something much more interesting. Uh, there's a much broader approach to the question. Uh, move to establish a nuclear weapons-free zone in the region. There's overwhelming international support for that. The non-aligned movement, uh, the Arab states, Egypt's been pressing it hard for 20 years. There's so much international support that uh, the Obama administration and its predecessors have been compelled to give kind of verbal assent. It would be a nice idea, but not now, and don't bother us. Uh, the, uh, it's possible to implement. Uh, last December, uh, there was supposed to be an international conference in Finland uh, under UN auspices to carry this idea forward. Uh, Iran agreed to attend in early November. Within days, Obama canceled the conference. Uh, uh, well, there's more, but I'll stop there. You know, this ought to be front page headlines. In the United States, not a word. Uh, here, probably the same. Uh, well, this is not a case of reporters distorting the facts. It's reporters being so obedient as part of the intellectual culture, like. Uh, other intellectuals don't report it either, uh, 
so subservient to state corporate power that you just don't report things like that. You don't look even. And of course, we know the reason. Uh, the basic reason is the United States does not want to allow uh, Israel's hundreds of nuclear weapons uh, to be either inspected or even discussed. Well, OK, that's a serious question. Uh, I might say that US strategic analysts, uh, many of them disagree. So the former head of the strategic command, you know, the, which controls nuclear weapons policies, uh, is headed, uh, developed one of the founders of the whole deterrence theory and so on. He, uh, he, said, uh, he said it is dangerous in the extreme for in the cauldron of animosities that we call the Middle East, yeah. for one country, meaning Israel, uh, to have hundreds of nuclear weapons, which encourages others to develop them. Well, that's pretty important. Try to find that. I mean, I've quoted it, you know, a couple other people. But, uh, and he's correct. It is dangerous in the extreme. Uh, uh, but that doesn't fit the paradigm. So it's not discussed. And uh, as I said before, I, I don't think that our institutional analysis really accounts for this uh, because a, it's over the whole intellectual community and uh, the institutional analysis doesn't apply there. I'm glad to hear it's not just journalists who are in your uh, sites, but it's a larger and deeper problem. You've explored it and expounded it with such clarity. Uh, I know that the people here would probably have stayed for another hour and a half gladly to hear more of you. The exhibition, Propaganda, Power and Persuasion, opens here at the British Library, 17th of May and runs till the 17th of September. It only remains for all of you to join me in thanking Professor Noam Chomsky. Thank you. Thank you very much.